already talked about classical conditioning and how it was the pairing of antecedents or stimuli to evoke an involuntary reflex. Next up, we're going to talk about operant conditioning. And operant conditioning is something very different, but there could be some overlaps. So operant conditioning is not about the antecedents or what comes before a behavior. It's about the consequences or what comes after a behavior. And the consequences are either something that's going to encourage or discourage the behavior. Encourage us to do it more often or discourage to do it less. And so this is a little bit different. We also know that operant conditioning tends to be more conscious than classical conditioning, though it could be conscious or unconscious. It will be more conscious than the first type of conditioning. And operant conditioning is more voluntary. It could be involuntary as well, but as compared to classical conditioning, it's going to be voluntary more often. So when we talked about classical conditioning, we were talking about involuntary reflexes in our body, such as blinking, such as sexual arousal, fear responses, happiness responses, hungriness, that type of thing. But when we look at operant conditioning, we're thinking about actions we can take that are a little bit more uh, we're aware of, or so it seems. So this could be things like what you choose to eat for lunch, or what, whether you choose to study, or whether you open a box or close a box, or if you text someone or turn your phone off or spend time on your phone. Now keep in mind, I said whether we're in control of these or so it seems, because even if these things are considered voluntary, the main name in this is B.F. Skinner, and he believed there was no free will. That is, he believed even with operant conditioning, although we were conscious of it and felt like we were in control of our bodies, what you order for lunch may not actually be your decision, even if you think it is. So B.F. Skinner was a radical behaviorist. He believed that everything we do, every decision we make, every action we take is something that is controlled by our past experiences. And this can really be elaborated by the law of effect as explained by Edward Thorndike, but expanded and really reinforced by Skinner. And so the law of effect is when a behavior has a satisfying effect or consequence, it is more likely to re be repeated in the future. And so that was Thorndike's original law of effect. He was a teacher and he actually used this in educating his students. But with Skinner, he took this a bit further and he started to talk about when something is satisfying or favorable, we'll do it more often. And when something is unsatisfying or unfavorable, we'll do it less often. And so because of this, Skinner really started to focus on two, two types of consequences known as reinforcement and punishment. Now to look at reinforcement and punishment, uh, Skinner was very good with his hands, very good at building lots of things. And one of the things he was well known for building, aside from the air crib he built for his daughter, was the operant conditioning chamber. And the operant conditioning chamber, sometimes called the Skinner box, but that wasn't his preferred name. He liked to call it an operant conditioning chamber. This is where an animal would be. And it would be either a rat or a pigeon in most circumstances. And so you can see in this diagram here, I'll make it a little bit bigger. And so we can see in this diagram here, we have a rat and there's a food cup, there's a dispenser tube to provide the food, and there's a lever as well as some signal lights or a speaker. And in this very simple situation, the rat may be learning that by pressing down the lever, uh, when one of the lights is lit up, that the pellet will be dispensed from the dispenser tube. Or if the other light is on, perhaps by pressing the lever, they will not receive food, but they will receive a mild electric shock through the shock generator. So if they press the lever when the red light's on, maybe they get a shock. If they press the lever when the green light's on, maybe they get a food pellet. Uh, and so through experimenting with different levers or different buttons that pigeons could peck with their nose, Skinner found he could train almost the minutia of life in these rats and pigeons. So we're gonna talk about these two types of consequences in more detail. So with regards to reinforcement, this was not considered the same as a reward. A reward may not necessarily change our behavior if we don't like the reward that we receive or if it's given to us under certain circumstances. But reinforcement is something that's going to be a pleasant consequence. And another word that behaviorists tend to use for this is appetitive. Appetitive has to do with pleasurable. It's not adversive. We like it. It's good. So an appetitive or pleasant consequence will evoke a pleasurable reflex. It'll make us happy. It'll make us relaxed. We enjoy it. A reinforcement could be tangible. It could be something we could hold in our hand and see and rotate. Or it could be something intangible like praise or attention or a belonging or acceptance. 
And what's really key about this is reinforcement is something that when we receive it, it will encourage us. It'll make us want to seek that reinforcement out again. So as mentioned, this is not the same as reward. If you imagine, sometimes people may praise you or give you things, but you don't like it. It might make you feel icky. They might smile at you, but you don't like their smile. Or they might hand you something as a gift, but now you feel obliged to give back and it was awkward. So it's not always the same as a reward, but a reinforcement is something that's always going to encourage your behavior. Reward may not encourage your behavior. This is different from punishment. Punishment is not appetitive. It is considered adversive or unpleasant. And this adversive or unpleasant consequence is going to evoke an unpleasant reflex in us. It makes us feel sad. It makes us feel disgusted. It makes us feel annoyed or bored. And just like reinforcement, punishment can be tangible. It could be something we could hold in our hand, like a clump of dirt or something really smelly, or it could be something intangible like a scolding or disapproval or exclusion. And so it could be something like a shock or it could be something like a prison sentence. But either way, this is going to be something that discourages our behavior. We don't want to receive this punishment. It's possible some people out there might like some things that are commonly considered punishment. Maybe they're looking for bad attention or negative attention. So in those cases, those wouldn't be punishments. Those would be reinforcements. It's only a punishment if it discourages us and discourages the behavior that we just performed. So at this point, you might be wondering what is the difference between classical and operant conditioning? So I just want to really highlight some of the differences. In classical conditioning, this is where we pair the unconditioned stimulus with the neutral stimulus. And these happen before the behavior. This happens before the reflex. And this is often very involuntary. It's possible in some circumstances for it to be voluntary, but most of the time we're talking about involuntary. Operant conditioning, on the other hand, is something that encourages or discourages a behavior. And this consequence follows the behavior. It doesn't come before it, it comes after it. And this is something that could be involuntary, but also could be voluntary. And based on that, operant is going to be voluntary more often than classical conditioning. And so if we think about classical conditioning, that's if you dust, if you blink when dust gets in your eye, versus operant conditioning be uh, how much screen time you get and do you choose to watch a television program? So something that could be a little bit more voluntary. Now where operant conditioning really deviates from classical conditioning is when we talk about these consequences that follow behavior, there's lots of different subtypes of consequences, whether it's reinforcement, whether it's punishment, whether it's tangible or intangible, and whether it's positive or negative. Now, this is very confusing. Positive and negative do not mean pleasant and unpleasant. They do not mean good or bad or favorable or unfavorable. Instead, when we refer to positive or negative in behavioral psychology, we are only talking about the mathematical addition of a stimuli or the mathematical removal of a stimuli. If these were called additional uh, consequence or subtractive consequence, that would be a lot easy. But unfortunately, that's not the labels they use in psychology. I wish they had different labels. So I like to think about these as the plus or negative ends on a battery or on a magnet because there's nothing um, unpleasant or pleasurable at either one of those ends. It's more the idea that they are just opposite ends. So think about mathematically or like a battery or like a magnet and don't think about them as unpleasant or pleasant. So because every, every type of consequence could be the addition of a stimuli, adding a stimuli to our environment, or removing a stimuli from our environment, we can think about four main subtypes of consequences. And these are things that are often misunderstood in the literature. Uh, even in textbooks, they misuse some of these labels, uh, but I really wanna make sure everybody's clear on this, so we're gonna go through these in detail. So when we think about positive reinforcement, what I want you to remember is this is the addition of something good that makes us happy. And so positive reinforcement is the idea that we're adding an appetite of stimuli. We're adding a pleasurable stimuli, and this will have a pleasurable consequence. And therefore this will encourage our behavior. This is the idea that we're adding hugs or love or attention or smiles or a rising intonation or prosody in our voice. We're giving rewards or money or food or gifts. So we're adding something we like that encourages a behavior. Now important, again, reinforcement is not the same as reward. It has to be something that's actually going to encourage us. And we find that positive reinforcement works best when it's unpredicted, when it's novel, when it's new and it's surprising. If somebody's expecting a reward, we find it's not actually all that reinforcing. But positive reinforcement is adding something good to make us happy. We can 
also add something that makes us not so happy. And this is positive punishment. Positive punishment is unpleasant to experience. Even though it has the word positive in it, that doesn't mean it's pleasant punishment. Positive punishment is unpleasant. And that's because positive punishment is adding something bad that makes us unhappy. So this is adding an adversive stimuli. And this results in an unfavorable consequence. So it's the idea somebody did something bad, so you're going to yell at them. You yelling at them is an unpleasant or adversive stimuli. You may use corporal punishment. You may um, uh, do something to them where you put dirty dishes in their bedroom. Uh, it might also be you hear a siren and you're just speeding on the highway or we arrest someone. That's adding the handcuffs and the, and the arrest uh, experience is a very adverse stimulus. So positive punishment is adding something unpleasant as the punishment. So adding a time out, uh, making someone have to go to the corner or wear a dunce cap or write, write lists on the board saying, I will not hit at school. That would be a positive punishment. It's not something pleasurable. Then we have what's known as a negative punishment. This is when we remove something good, which makes us sad. So this is the idea that we can punish someone by adding something they don't like. We can also punish someone by taking away something they do like. And so this is when we remove an appetite of stimuli. This is the idea that you may take away a child's toy if they're misbehaving. You may see how long they have to go home and end the play date if they're not behaving them well. In addition to someone's uh, if someone's speeding on the highway, in addition to uh, being arrested, they might receive a fine. And the fine is the idea they have to pay money and lose money, which would be a negative punishment. And some really harsh ones are the idea that you might take away something intangible like love or approval or acceptance. So this is a very unfavorable consequence that it seeks to discourage and make the behavior more infrequent. And the final one is negative reinforcement. I really want to emphasize here that a lot of textbooks misuse the term negative reinforcement, so I want to be really clear with this. Negative reinforcement is when you remove an adversive stimuli to make you happy. A lot of times people think negative reinforcement is punishment. Negative reinforcement is not punishment, it's reinforcement. Reinforcement always is a pleasurable consequence that encourages a behavior. And the reason why negative reinforcement is pleasurable and encouraging is because the thing that we're removing, the thing that we're subtracting from this environment is an adversive stimuli. This is the idea your alarm clock is going off and it's really annoying. You turn off by turning off the alarm clock by getting out of bed, the adversive stimuli stops. This is the idea that the rats are learning how to avoid a shock in the Skinner box or in the operant conditioning chamber. Maybe if they press the button at the right time, they won't receive the shock. This is the idea that if you perform well at school, you may get to be out of your obligations for the day and you don't have to do your homework, don't have to do your chores. Remove that stuff. If someone is nagging you and nagging you and nagging you and all of a sudden you do something and it makes them go away, that would be negative reinforcement. You remove the annoying stimulus from your life. So negative reinforcement is the idea we're removing an aversive stimuli to make us happy.